Hello, my name is Evan, and today I would like to share with you my comparative study on seabird populations and diversity between rocky and sandy beaches. Um, before beginning this presentation, however, there are a few acknowledgements that I would like to address. Firstly, the land that we inhabit and use originally belong to the indigenous and we must pay our respects to the original landowners. We must respect the land and remember that it did not originally belong to us, so its use should always be with good intentions. Additionally, I would like to thank my teacher, Isabel Abe, and my TA, Ellen, for assisting me with the development of my experiment and offering many helpful suggestions, which ultimately helped guide me towards my design and execution of this experiment. Okay, so just some quick background information about this experiment so you can kind of see where I came from. So we first need to address the question and what it is that we are trying to solve or figure out from this experiment. So here we would like to find out how seabird populations and diversity compare between rocky beaches and sandy beaches. And our null hypothesis to test this question is that seabird populations and diversity are higher at rocky beaches compared to sandy beaches. This experiment was run over the course of two days at two separate beaches found at Point Pleasant Park, one being a sandy beach and one will being a rocky beach. Uh, we will compare the overall bird sightings and the overall diversity of bird, seabirds between the two beach types. So these are some um, photos from Google Images that essentially just show the two uh, types of beaches that I covered. So you can see in the top of Sandy Beach, the bottom of Rocky Beach, these are actually just the sites from which I perform my experiments. I didn't get any good pictures of birds just because it was hard to always make recordings and also take pictures of birds while capturing their movement and their activity and their physical features. Also, the distance from my phone also made the pictures a little bit worse. So yeah, but these are just, these just show where I perform the experiments. So now we can go on and to discuss some of the methods that I used to collect the data for this experiment and what I'm going to do with it essentially. So firstly, I identified the beach types using habitat clues. So some of these habitat clues include present slash dominant species, uh, the substrate type, so you know sand versus rocks versus cobble versus boulders, stuff like that, and then also the physical layouts so of stuff like gradients and you know just the overall slope of the beach. Uh, I then used the transect and marked down a distance of 10 meters parallel to the shore in any intertidal region. It doesn't specifically matter whether it was low or high. Um, prior to this, I obtained three random time intervals in which I'm going to walk along the transect and make the observations. So I walked and observed for 10 minutes at each site facing the same direction and recorded every time a bird crossed my field of view and made note of the species, uh, physical characteristics, and the activity it was doing. Uh, using the data, I did I performed calculations, uh, which were in Excel, to get the, propor the proportion, uh, the log of the proportion, and then the proportion times the log of the proportion, and the diversity of each beach type as well and species. And then we also used average bird sightings and diversity were compared between the two sites. Uh, we made graphs with standard error bars, which were derived from the standard deviation, and then the t-tests were performed in order to see whether the data was significant. And then other factors such as time, uh, time of day and the tide were kept consistent to try and keep everything equal. Okay, so some identifiable trends from, uh, from our results. So on average, we found that the Loris argentatus was the most commonly observed bird across the six sites. So essentially this me just means that it crossed my field of view the most times compared to every other bird that was identified. Uh, there was a lot more variation in the number of bird species in figure one, meaning that there is a greater fluctuation in the number of bird species that I saw uh, across the different sites. So essentially, at site one, there could have been like four sightings, and then at site two and three, there was like zero. So it just gave us big variation in numbers. Um, and then lastly, when, when overall sightings were higher, there was a greater diversity as well, which could show a relationship between these two ecosystem characteristics. This actually makes sense, meaning that the more observations we saw, there was actually more birds that were identified as well, or more diversity in that individual uh, habitat type. So these are our actual final results from the experiment and the numbers that we got from doing our statistical analyses. So at Sandy Beaches, we determined that there was an average of approximately 13.33 bird sightings per site, and the diversity gave us a reading of 1.245. And then at Rocky Beaches, we had an average of 17.33 bird sightings with a diversity reading of approximately 1.487. So... From here, we performed our t-test, which we used to analyze our bird sightings and, and diversity, and we produced a p-value of uh, 0.119 for 
bird sightings, and our second t-test was used to, on diversity data, produced a p-value of 0 0.299. Uh, because our p-values are greater than 0 0.05, we can fail to reject the null hypothesis and say that the seabird populations in diversity are higher at rocky beaches compared to sandy beaches. Okay, so now in terms of our results, we can discuss them by comparing it to comp other studies that have been uh, previously performed. So the data has obviously shown that seabirds prefer rocky intertidal beaches, but uh, why is that exactly? So in another study performed in 2018 by Waget, or Waget uh, in which seabird habitat selection was monitored uh, in relation to prey, they found that seabirds tended to drift towards beaches which had more access to prey or uh, the abundance of prey and the time that it took to locate the prey. Those are the two main factors that drove uh, seabirds to choose certain habitats. So uh, cross-referencing this with another study performed by Grantham in 2003, in which five distinct beach habitats were studied, which included uh, rocky intertidals, sandy intertidals, uh, subtitles, uh, kelp forests, and soft bottom habitats, it was discovered that rocky intertidal zones uh, actually had the highest or, sorry, rocky intertidal zones diversity and abundance of prey was generally found to be higher compared to the other intertidal zones. Um, this supports the null hypothesis showing why seabirds would prefer rocky intertidal zones over sandy beaches. Okay, so some biological or ecological reasons why we believe the outcome is that it was is because, again, prey abundance and diversity is higher at rocky intertidal zones compared to sandy ones. Uh, this includes, but not limited to, crustaceans, seaweed, and uh, fish, so which are all sources of food for seabirds, so they would choose places where abundance is just generally higher. Um, access to prey is easy. It doesn't really require much difficulty to access, which generally means less output of energy for hunting. And again, uh, the input of energy through food being more available and the output of energy being less is just perfect. Um, and then lastly, uh, seabirds use rocky intertidal zones for various reasons and just their general lifestyle. Some of the, some of these reasons include uh, areas to rest, uh, provides breeding grounds, so places to make nests and raise young. And then also uh, waiting grounds for prey so they can sit and wait and identify fish and then go and hunt. So some sources of error or limitations for the study. So one big limitation for the study was the lack of variance of locations. Uh, so there were only three locations across two beaches. Uh, more sites at different beaches would provide us with more information on a larger scale, so not really confined to one park or just one uh, entire like habitat. Um, some outside factors could also play a role in habitat selection that aren't related to the beach type. Um, and in more in more locations, if birds prefer like sheltered beaches or like wind speed is slower there or being closer to the forest because it'll be closer to resources there's reasons outside of like beach wise that they would select for that habitat um the length of the beach traveled so essentially if we were to if we were again to have more sites along the beach it's possible that more species could have been identified further down if we kept going but again limited limited sites so limited observations um, the time in between observations, so leaving more time in between time intervals would have allowed more birds maybe to leave or come back, which maybe would have given us more variance in numbers, as opposed to the intervals being so close together, and then obviously that caused the data to probably not change as much as it could have, uh, showing that each like site had like similar numbers of birds. And then the lack of studies comparing uh, type of birds, uh, diversity of birds, and more related to general intertidal zones and characteristics of suitable habitats. So they don't actually talk much about the actual uh, site. They just talk about like suitable habitats based on like prey abundance and stuff like that. So some future work and possible societal implications of this study. So we could perform again a meta-analysis meta comparing uh, many different rocky and sandy beaches and even include other habitats like marshes and dunes to see why birds uh, seabirds select for certain habitat types uh, it can help us understand population dynamics of seabirds by tracking numbers observed in their habitat uh, and then from this also we can keep track of like endangered bird species to make sure that they're not being damaged or didn't put in any danger by anything identifying the land they use to keep it safe and protect it from like hunting uh, being industrialized and other forms of damage so like pollution even so the two-eyed seeing, the two-eyed seeing is a combination of methods from the indigenous and the new west to develop uh, solutions just to better humanity. It's pretty much just solutions that can benefit both sides. Um, so it's important that although the use of the land is important for uh, resources, it is also very important to remember to, we must keep the land healthy and remember that the exploitation of land isn't always necessary or even should be used at all. 
Um, this can be applied for the development of land and pollution causing uh, damage to seabird habitat. And although it wasn't specifically mentioned in my uh, review, there have been plenty of studies that have uh, been released showing the effects of microplastics and other forms of pollution, uh, disrupting food webs, causing shifts in seabird habitat selection patterns. Uh, it's important to keep the land healthy and remember that there are many animals that rely on this land uh, for resource and resources and live here, so we must respect their lives as well. So, in conclusion, it was discovered that rocky beaches have higher seabird populations and diversity compared to sandy beaches. Uh, from other resources, we can help connect biological and ecological uh, reasons for this, uh, including prey abundance and physical layout characteristics of rocky beaches, which led to more suitable habitat potentially for seabirds. However, more studies really do need to be performed uh, in, like this in order to really get a good understanding of the comparison between specific habitat types and to understand why seabirds select for certain uh, habitat types over other. Uh, thank you for listening to my presentation. Uh, the few references that I did use are just below. Uh, thank you.